Okay, I, I'm Elisma van der Vestijzen from the Accounting Standards Board. This is a second part of a recording on the guideline published by the board on accounting for landfill sites. I, I'm just quickly showing you the contents page again. Um, so in the first part of the recording, we went through the objective and the scope of the guideline, the life cycle of the landfill site asset, and we looked at the accounting considerations for land in a landfill site and a landfill site asset. So this is the second part of the recording where we are going to look at the rehabilitation provision, as well as some other considerations in accounting for landfill sites and then how you apply the guideline for the first time. So as I noted in the first part of the recording, there is quite a bit of detail in the slides that I'm not going to go through necessarily in detail in the recording, but please have a look at our website where we have made the slides available as well. So let's look at the guidance on accounting for the rehabilitation provision. Um, so I think just to note that we do have a, high, a highly regulated environment within which landfill sites are operated. And because of legislated requirements that surround landfill sites, there are certain obligations that are being placed on entities, um, which gives rise to a provision. So in accounting for landfill sites and in developing this guideline, we looked at the requirements of GRAP 19 on provisions, uh, contingent assets and contingent liabilities to develop those requirements specifically for landfill sites. Um, so as we've noted in the first recording, we are not introducing any new requirements or changing on any of the existing requirements in GRAP 19, but we're simply interpreting them for landfill sites. So because of legislation like the Waste Act, minimum requirements, as well as license conditions, they could be sort of two separate activities within landfill site assets or um, the, a landfill site operation that gives rise to obligations that are uh, liabilities for entities. So firstly, where an entity is constructing certain assets on a landfill site, you would have an obligation to dismantle and remove those, those assets that have been constructed as soon as you start with that construction or development. So an example that we have here is where you develop your landfill site asset in tranches or in cells. And as soon as you start constructing those tranches or those cells, at the reporting date, you have an obligation to remove that, uh, that part that you have already constructed. So the activity that gives rise to your obligation is the construction that commences. The second part that you have an obligation for is the receival of the waste that you are safely storing. So um, you do have a requirement in terms of legislation to restore the environment after land has been received and uh, as land, oh, sorry, as waste is being safely stored. And that rehabilitation provision commences as you are or, or when you start receiving waste. Um, and then it, of course, at the, the reporting date depends on the extent to which you have undertaken that activity and that is going to, to enforce your liability. So um, just on the slide, we have two options where you have a larger site that are typically, or that is typically developed in tranches or, or cells, whereas the smaller landfill sites and some of the older landfill sites, I think that we came across are not developed in that way. So they potentially only have a liability for the environmental damage that they are going to restore, nothing that they need to uh, deconstruct as part of the provision as well. So I think lastly, just to note, we often heard in developing the guideline that entities are unable to recognize the provision because they do not have the funding yet to incur those future costs. They are only going to receive funds for that in future. Just to note that, and again, this is applying GRAP 19, that there is no link between the funding and the liability. You have a liability because of certain activities in legislation and um, you are not uh, going to assess whether or not you have funding for that. So in measuring the liability, there are sort of two components to this. The first one is the cash flows. 
And the second aspect of measuring this would be your discount rate that you apply to those cash flows. So we're first going to look at the cash flows and then the discount rate separately. So just there on the slide, we have the definition of a GRAP 19 liability. It is the best estimate of the expenditure required to settle the present obligation at reporting date. So there are a number of different elements there. Um, the present obligation means that it's only the portion that you have an obligation for at that date. And the, re and the, the best estimate at the reporting date means that it must be a present value. Um, so not stated in future terms. Then I do want to note that you could have um, a time value of money element that, that plays a role here and you are required to express this in the present value of your expenditure, meaning that you are potentially going to discount this liability if the effect of discounting is material. I think what we have seen with landfill sites is that the useful life of the landfill site asset is often very long, meaning that the point at which you are going to rehabilitate is often very long in the future. Um, so you, you would have more likely than not a material time value of money element and therefore you would probably be discounting. You assess each of them and, and calculate each of them and they they form part together of your rehabilitation provision. So the first part is a cost to dismantle any of the constructed assets on your landfill site. So this part you could have irrespective of whether you have received any waste at that point and any cost to restore land on an ongoing basis. So maybe if you have a tranche or a cell that's reached capacity, you are capping that and no longer um, depositing any waste in that. So that is part of your ongoing rehabilitation costs. The second portion is in terms of the minimum requirement, you are required to, to do some activities pre-closure pre like planning um, and compilation of a final closure report. So there are also certain investigations that are undertaken at that point. Um, those costs are another component or an element of your provision. Then thirdly, the cost that will be incurred in the year of closure and during the period of final rehabilitation. So the minimum requirements do include uh, some of these things like final cover, capping, topsoil vegetation, uh, some other long-term systems such as leachates, gas and stormwater systems, for example. All those final rehabilitation and closure costs uh, form the third part of your provision. Then lastly, we have the period that you are going to monitor the site and conduct certain inspection activities. And that could be the period of up to 30 years um, that we spoke about in the first presentation. It just depends on your conditions, but um, I think 30 years is sort of the norm that we, we came across. So all of these costs that you are going to incur in that period post-closure is an, the last element of your rehabilitation provision. So if we look at the discount rate, um, I think just a couple of things to note here. It is a pre-tax rate that's just in terms of CRAP 19. Um, most of these considerations are just in terms of CRAP 19. You reflect the current market assessment of time value of money and any risks that are specific to the liability you are going to adjust it for factors that are relevant to the landfill sites. Um, the period that you consider, it must be consistent with the estimated cash flows required to settle your provision. Then if you did include inflation in your cash flows, then you are also going to determine a discount rate that includes inflation. If it excludes inflation, your cash flows, you are excluding um, inflation from your discount rate. So I think just one other thing to note when it comes to adjusting for risks and uncertainties, so definitely these should be taken into account, but you do have a choice whether you adjust your cash flows or your discount rate for them. This is an element of judgment, um, but the board has encouraged entities to rather take risk and uncertainties into account in your cash flows. 
I think they've um, realized it may be just a bit easier to think about these things and to express them uh, in an um, amount, a monetary amount, rather than as a percentage. So um, with those two elements, the cash flows and the discount rate, you are then going to be able to calculate your, your provision um, at the present value at the reporting date. Then just to, to mention to you, you are only going to use this provision, i.e. debit the provision, for costs that you have initially included when you have established your provision. So you are not reducing your provision for costs that you are not or you have not included in that provision. Then you are de-recognizing all or a part of that provision when you no longer need it. So when you have used uh, used that portion, then you are de-recognizing it. There is an IGRAP that I also just want to make you aware of, IGRAP 2, which deals with changes in existing decommission, restoration and similar liabilities. So that IGRAP certainly applies here to any changes that uh, relate to the timing or the amount of your, um, sorry, apologies, your estimated outflows, any changes in your discount rate or uh, increase in the pass for the passage of time in your provision. So all of those changes to your provision are explained in grab, I grab two. Um, so it is deducted from or added to your landfill site asset, depending on the way in which the movement in the provision goes. Um, but just apply IGRAP2 here because there are some things to consider. For example, whether you are on the cost or the revaluation model, um, the, the choice that you've made per, IGRA, per GRAP17 could influence this. I do also just want to mention on the measurement that there are a number of different examples in the guideline on how you measure. So I would encourage you to have a look at those examples as it could assist you to measure this. Um, then a number of other considerations that I just quickly want to mention to you with relation to landfill sites is some entities do have an obligation to rehabilitate, but they are receiving funding from a third party to cover the costs of that. So we've heard about two ways in which this could happen. Firstly, the entity that has the obligation to rehabilitate receives the, fun the funding from another party. So in that case, you are going to account for this as a GRAP23 non-exchange revenue transaction. Another scenario that we heard of is the party that has or the entity that has the obligation to rehabilitate is not receiving any funding directly, but uh, another party is paying a third party to rehabilitate it on this entity's behalf. So in that case, the entity with the obligation is receiving a service in kind because it's receiving the benefit of another entity rehabilitating the site on its behalf. So again, that is accounted for in GRAP23 as a non-exchange transaction, um, just certain requirements in GRAP23 when you recognize services in kind or whether you just disclose that that's an assessment that you need to make. There could be various different arrangements in practice with undertaking waste disposal activities. Um, so, for example, we've heard about principal agent relationships. We've heard about arrangements that could be seen as service concession arrangements or otherwise some sort of joint control arrangement. Um, so whatever the arrangement is that you have, you are going to have to make an assessment to see what standard of GRAP could potentially apply to, to that arrangement and then account for your rights and obligations as an entity in accordance with that standard of GRAP that applies to your arrangement. So I think lastly, we've heard about fines and penalties. So there are uh, various different legislated requirements that govern the operation of landfill sites and where an entity in any point in the process potentially breaches one of those requirements, there could be a fine or a penalty instituted upon the entity. To account for that fine and penalty, you are going to look at GRAP 19 on provisions accounting for um, contingent liabilities and contingent assets to see whether you have a liability for that fine and penalty and when you are going to recognize that.
So then lastly, applying the guideline, it is uh, quite straightforward in the guideline to say that you are going to apply GRAP 3 on accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates and errors to initially align your accounting policies to what the guideline requires you, that you to have your accounting policies as. Um, I think I've said in the first recording that we are not introducing new requirements or changing existing requirements. We are simply interpreting the existing requirements in the environment of landfill sites. Um, but nevertheless, the guideline was developed because of divergence in practice. So we do recognize that entities may need to change their policies to align to the guideline. The board is not explicitly saying you have an error or you are changing your accounting policies. You are going to apply judgment to see what's applicable in your circumstances. So um, that is really the end of the presentation. I do just want to share with you to keep informed. We do have a number of resources on our website. We have frequently asked questions. Um, we do have specific COVID-19 guidance. We've issued research papers on a number of topics. And then also very informative is our newsletter and uh, posts on social media. So please follow us on those platforms to make sure that you keep informed. Um, the Office of the Accountant General also publishes accounting guidelines on the standards of CRAP. So please have a look at their website if you do have any, any questions related to the standards. So lastly, I do just want to emphasize again, if you have any questions related to the guideline, please send us an email at info at and we will respond to your question. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.